The, uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Marco Neira. Uh, Marco is a colleague whom I, I knew for many years, uh, uh, a vector biologist uh, um, working on transmission of diseases and how we can reduce vector, we can make vector control. Uh, he was uh, an academic uh, in, uh, in Ecuador uh, until very recently, and we have been very fortunate that he uh, chose to come to the Cypress Institute uh, the last in the past a few months, uh, and I'm saying that we're very fortunate not only because we have Marco with us, but also because he took over the uh, coordination of the drafting of the M uh, uh, of the CCI report of the task force, um, and uh, this is what he will be presenting today. Marco, thank you very much, George, for that very generous introduction. And let me just say that I feel. Where the luck is mutual. I'm very lucky to be working with such a distinguished group. Um, I will start sharing my screen then. Okay. Can you see my my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, well, uh, well, welcome everybody and thanks a lot for Marco. Could you uh, put it on full? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting to you uh, the work that we've been doing in the in the health task force within the context of this Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East Climate Change Initiative that uh, Dr. Uh, Costas introduced. Um, just. So briefly to introduce the, the task force is coordinated by George Christophilis, which is the, the president of the institute, and the liaison coordinators are myself and Dr. Camille Erguller. Uh, we have uh, 13 members coming from several countries in the region and from uh, different uh, international organizations. These are all distinguished academics working in the field of health, and we are constantly looking for uh, new uh, members from uh, the region who are willing to be part of this initiative. The work that I'm going to present to you focuses on the effects of climate change uh, in the EME region, and we have chosen to cover the topics of exposure to extreme heat, water shortage, air pollution, uh, vector bone diseases, and population displacement. Now, uh, a lot of what I've said, uh, the basis have been already covered by my colleagues who spoke before me, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details to save some time. But as you know, uh, the rising average temperatures and heat waves are probably the most important and direct effect of climate change on human health. The conditions associated with uh, exposure to heat uh, are both in the clinical spectrum and also in the mental and behavioral spectrum. In the clinical spectrum, I, you know, exposure to extreme heat has been associated with stress, stroke, kidney disease, uh, myocardial infarction, imbalance in electrolytes, uh, and respiratory disease. While uh, it has also been recorded that periods of extreme heat are associated with increases in sleep disturbances, cognitive, cognitive deficits, uh, and increases in aggressive and criminal behavior, homicides, and suicides. Uh, the population that is most vulnerable to exposure to extreme heat includes people that are about, about 65 years of age, so the elderly, people living in poverty, and people affected by other uh, chronic health conditions or mental disorders, as well as people working outdoors. Uh, interestingly, it has been established that, especially in the elderly group, women are more susceptible than men to the effects of climate change and extreme heat. Um, interesting, interestingly, as one of my colleagues mentioned, uh, there has been actually a reduction in the number of deaths uh, associated with heat waves uh, associated with the warmer regions of the planet. Uh, so it, it seems that the warmer areas, the areas that are used to being exposed to extreme heat, are developing a level of resilience uh, that allows them to adapt to these uh, phenomena. And this, the same resilience, is not necessarily observed in colder areas, areas that are not exposed regularly to extreme heat waves. So in those areas is where you see a steep increase in the death rates when, when particularly hot periods of time uh, come along. These resilience uh, are associated with the implementation of measures such as health, uh, heat health action plans, the early warning systems, a high prevalence of air conditioning in the buildings, and the buildings of the design of buildings that maintain cool temperatures inside, as well as the adaptation of medical services that efficiently prevent uh, the morbidity and mortality caused by heat, extreme heat. 
In the EMEA region, um, we find that, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean and Europe are amongst the world's most vulnerable regions to heat exposure. And this is caused by a combination of factors. Of course, the geographic location is important, but also the extremely high urbanization rates that some of the cities in the region have seen, uh, as well as the aging populations. And with aging comes a high prevalence of chronic diseases that makes people more vulnerable to the effects of extreme weather. Um, this was clearly exemplified by the summer of 2003, where over 70,000 fatalities were seen in Europe, as we saw before. And in more recent years, countries like Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus, and Kuwait have uh, recorded excess death mortalities associated with particularly hot uh, periods of time. Uh, it is expected that parts of this EMA region will reach exceedingly high temperatures, reaching about 50 degrees Celsius. And in some exceptional cases, this could, this could reach 60 degrees Celsius, especially in the urban areas uh, where the heat is amplified by the urban heat island effect that we heard from Andy's presentation. Um, and a particularly troubling report uh, states that under the business as usual scenario for greenhouse gas emissions, several cities uh, in the in the EMA region, especially in the Gulf, are going to reach temperatures that are so high that they might be above the actual physiological limits for human survival. In this graphic that you see here, uh, if you look at the uh, areas that I have highlighted in yellow, this red straight line represents the wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees, which is the actual physiological limit for human survival. And you know, in blue we see the historical variation in temperatures, and then in the in the right hand panel we see in red the predicted variations under business as usual scenarios, and uh, in green uh, the predicted variation under more optimistic scenarios of greenhouse emissions. And you can see that in at least in five cities: Dharan, Bandar Abbas, Dubai, Doha, and Abu Dhabi, we are going to find periods of time where the temperature might exceed that ratio of 35 degrees. Uh, and that means that there is going to be, basically, it's going to become impossible to survive outside in these areas, even for short periods of time, because temperatures are just lethal for human beings. So, of course, it is clear that exposure to extreme heat is probably one of the most relevant uh, factors of climate change in human health. Um, the other aspect that we are focusing on is the effects of uh, water shortage. And we know that the Middle East and Southeast, uh, the Southeast Mediterranean are probably one of, or some of the most, the driest region, regions where the least availability of water in the world. Uh, in the Middle East, nine out of 15 countries experience what is defined as absolute water scarcity. That is less than 500 cubic meters of natural renewal water per person per year. That is less than one third of the bare minimum established as necessary for human survival. 60% uh, of the population lives under either high or very high water stress conditions. In the Southeast Mediterranean, the situation is not much better, with 180 million people experiencing water scarcity. That is a little bit better, so it's less than 1,000 cubic uh, meters of natural water per person per year. Uh, and 80 million people experience absolute water scarcity. So to put this on a more graphic uh, display, these are the percentages of the populations in some of the countries of the area that are exposed to either high or very high uh, surface water stress, uh, water stress, and this was for 2010. But as you can see, in many countries of the MSL, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, the West Bank, Lebanon, Kuwait, and Bahrain, uh, the, of the population is either under high or very high surface water stress. And all of the countries, probably with the exception of Egypt, are well above the world average uh, for this factor. So it is clear that the lack of water and renewable water resources is one of the main problems that the AIM region is facing in the future. Now, as we know, with the exception of air, water is probably the uh, most necessary element for survival. And people will find and they are forced to drink water any way they can. So when no safe water is available, people will find and store water for using from any sources that are available. These causes that people will often consume water of subpar so quality that might be infected with uh, bacteria or viruses. And these are the, the, one of the most important direct effects of water shortage. 
when people consume water that is contaminated, diarrheal disease is the most common effect. And diarrheal disease is probably the most important cause of uh, disease burden for children be below the age of nine. Uh, the outbreaks of waterborne disease can happen both in developed and underdeveloped nations. So these are not exclusively happening in underdeveloped nations, but can also happen in wealthy nations when the water is short. So Middle Eastern countries have quite important mortality rates uh, in children associated with diarrheal disease. Now, when the water is contaminated, not necessarily with bacteria or viruses, but with parasites, the consumption are the contact with this water also cause uh, infections that are debilitating, such as the trachonculiasis and fistosomiasis. When the water is contaminated with chemical compounds, with metals, organic compounds, or pesticides, there is a whole range of diseases that can be associated with this, ranging from minor disorders to life-altering conditions, such as cancer and fetal abnormalities. And also people, when they don't have access to safe running water, they are forced to store water. This water easily becomes a breeding grounds for vectors of disease, so insects, especially mosquitoes, that are very good at transmitting uh, infectious disease amongst the population. So these places, people which who don't have access to water, constant access to water, sometimes at an elevated risk of vector-borne diseases. This is just a graphic to show the percentage of deaths among children uh, age, uh, under age five that are attributable to uh, diarrhea. And as we can see, uh, there is quite a bit of this, uh, especially in the Syrian Arab Republic, where the percentage of children dying of diarrheal disease is well above the world average. Now, talking about more indirect effects of water shortage on health, uh, of course, the reduction of uh, the availability of water has an effect on the agricultural productivity of any region, and this actually increases food prices. And with increased food prices comes a reduced, reduced capability of the population to obtain appropriate nutrition from local sources. And of course, this also causes negative economic effects uh, at the national level, especially a reduced revenue in agricultural exports, which translates into reduction in uh, national uh, GDP. And this can actually be dramatic, as I'm going to show in, in a little bit. Um, and least but not last, uh, we have problems associated with physical transportation of water. Often when water is not readily available, people have to make long journeys from the water source to bring water to their, to their dwellings. And this is a task that is often uh, left to women and children. And the heavy transportation, the transportation of these heavy burdens repeatedly can actually have uh, injuries, bodily injuries associated with the carrying of these heavy weights, but also the time consumed by this process is time that this population is not using for engaging in either educational activities or activities that can actually be financially productive. So it, it stimulates the, uh, this vicious cycle where people are remain in poverty. And of course, this has implications in their health status. This is just a prediction of the economic impacts of water scarcity in national GDP for the different regions of the world by 2050. As you can see in, in, the, in this first bar here that represents the average GDP for the Middle East, we are expecting, uh, in the worst case, a massive reduction of 14% in the GDP of the region. And even in a relatively benign scenario, there will still be a reduction of 6% in the GDP of the, of the region. So water scarcity will have an important effect on the economy of the region, and therefore this economic effect will uh, cause, for sure, effects on the health of the people. Now, the other aspect that we have been covering is um, the effect of vector-borne diseases, uh, what the climate change has, the effect that climate change has in vector-borne diseases. Um, the epidemiology of vector-borne diseases is heavily influenced by climatic change, mainly because the insects that transmit these diseases are what is known as thermoconformers. So these uh, insects do not self-regulate their body temperature, but their body temperature varies according to the environmental temperature. And of course, from a biological perspective, when body temperature changes, a lot of physiological processes are affected. So environmental temperature is a major determinant in the biology of vectors and vector-borne diseases. Uh, it's not just temperature that is defining the transmission of diseases, also precipitation, humidity, wind, and also 
uh, more socioeconomic factors such as population density, access to running water, as we saw, housing quality, and the behaviors and adaptations of the local community. So, a combination of ecological and socioeconomical factors uh, means that in the EME region uh, is has the appropriate conditions for a whole lot of uh, vector-borne diseases to be transmitted. Uh, I am not going to cover all of them because there might be too many, but I, I want to mention three categories that are particularly interesting. Aeroviral diseases, so these are viral diseases transmitted by, by vectors, malaria, and leishmaniasis. <clears throat> Among the aeroviral diseases, the diseases we have names that are probably familiar to you, like West Nile fever, dengue, chikungunya, Zika. And I want to make an important point here, and is that with increased temperatures, the way the biology of viruses works, uh, increased temperatures usually mean an increased reproduction rate for the viruses. And every time the viruses are reproducing, they are replicating the genetic material, and this opens the door for mutations to appear. So with increased temperatures, it becomes more likely that we'll, you'll have a fast rate of new strains, new mutations appearing in the viruses that are existing. And this is interesting now, I think, because we are all experiencing, you know, very closely what happens with a new virus that is on the scene or when new variants of a virus appear. And I think we can expect to see this happening with vector-borne diseases in the near future. Um, malaria is a disease that historically was endemic to Europe and several of the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle Eastern countries. It was eradicated from Europe in the 1960s, but it has re-emerged in recent years in several areas, including Greece, Cyprus, and in, uh, also there's been activity in Saudi Arabia, although most EME countries show a trend towards elimination of malaria. However, the potential for re-emergency of this disease exists and is something that we need to be uh, keen on paying attention to. Leishmaniasis is also a disease that is very relevant to, to the region, more than 50% of all the global uh, cases of cutaneous leishmaniasis come from this, this region. Uh, and there has been uh, shown a correlation between the incidence of leishmaniasis and increased temperatures and precipitations. Now, the models, most of the models predict that the geographic distribution of the vectors that transmit leishmaniasis is going to change due to climate, due to the changes in climate. And most likely, these vectors are going to spread to areas adjacent to the Mediterranean and are also likely to disappear from areas in North Africa and the Middle East where temperatures would probably go above what the insects can tolerate. So the relation between vector-borne disease and disease, between vector-borne disease and climate is not always linear and is rather complex. This is a graphic that is taken from the Lancet scandal on uh, climate and health, and it just shows globally the vectorial capacity for transmission of dengue for two of the main insect vectors, for Aedes aegypti in, in the red line and for Aedes albopictus in the blue line. And you can see that over the course of the last decades, the global capacity of these uh, species for transmitting uh, dengue in particular has been increasing consistently. And this is not, uh, the EME is not the exception to this rule, so it's, it's a concern that we have to all be very keen on observing. Now, there's also uh, effects caused by dust storms and air pollution. Uh, as we already saw in one of the presentations, dust storms are associated with a whole lot of resp respiratory diseases, allergies. Um, we have in the EME that the position of dust particles from the Sahara and the Arabian Peninsula uh, causes a high concentration of dust deposition in, 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 this, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean Middle East. Uh, the global drying and warming uh, that we're experiencing causes an increase in the frequency and intensity of dust storms. And these particles of dust can carry actually pathogenic microbes, uh, nuclear and also chemical contaminants over very long distances. And these can actually uh, spread wide open uh, some uh, diseases that are related to, to the inhalation of these, uh, these particles. Air pollution has also been associated with a whole lot of diseases going from allergies, uh, chronic pulmonary disease, respiratory uh, illnesses, cardiovascular disease, uh, and lung, uh, lung cancer and heart disease. The groups that are susceptible to these diseases include the very young, the elderly, and people with uh, chronic cardiopulmonary diseases. Around 1 million people die in Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean due to air pollution every year, and 
specifically Turkey and Iran, all these countries from the EMA region, among the global 15 countries with the highest premature mortality attributable to air pollution, at least that was for the year 2010. Several factors contribute to air, to air pollution, forest fires, uh, forest fires, urbanization, and fossil fuel burning. And I think we have covered uh, some of these aspects in the last presentations. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Um, I think fossil fuel burning is particularly concerning because fossil fuels are the dominating form of energy supply in the region. And byproducts of fossil fuels will uh, do cause uh, an, an increase in these toxic compounds, which uh, are tightly related to uh, health effects, including also nitrogen oxide and organic volatile compounds. And interestingly, there is correlation between the production of, production of these uh, greenhouse uh, gases and the generation of extremely toxic compounds that happens in particularly hot areas. The heat, especially in, in the urban heat islands, uh, contributes to the decomposition of some of these, these uh, byproducts of fossil fuel burning that create extremely toxic compounds that then have effects on the human health. And the last aspect that we want to cover uh, is the effect of climate change on the health of displaced populations. Um, it has been shown that climate change can cause uh, population displacement in several ways, uh, increasing the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events that forces people to move to look for better lands, uh, the loss of land to sea level rise, the deterioration of life sustaining ecosystems, and also by influencing the outcome of uh, conflict that has being triggered by other economic, social, or political factors. And in this sense, uh, climate change can act either as a risk multiplier that is exacerbating the pre-existing tensions and increasing the likelihood that these tensions will result actually in a violent confrontation that could otherwise be uh, found a peaceful resolution. Or for uh, con conflicts that are already going on, Climate change and the harshness it can impose can act as a peace inhibitor. So it creates conditions that undermine the peaceful resolution of conflicts. Uh, in either case, uh, by 2019, the global number of people that have been forcibly displaced from their lands reached 79.5 million, and 40% of these were children. Uh, and this is particularly important for the EMA region because in this region, we find some of the countries that are the origin of some of the largest displaced populations, but also we find countries that are hosts to some of the largest displaced populations in the world. And this can be seen here in this, in this graphic. In the left-hand panel, we have the countries, uh, the top international uh, displacement situations by country of origin. And we can see that Syria and Iraq, they are both part of the EMA region, are among the top in uh, countries of origin of displaced populations, Syria being by far the largest. And also, uh, Turkey, the Islamic Republic of Iran and Lebanon are amongst the countries that host some of the largest uh, displaced populations in the world, with Turkey being the largest uh, host of displaced populations. So the, the health uh, issues of displaced populations are particularly interesting to the, the EMA region. Now, obviously, there's a whole lot to say about the health of displaced populations, and I can hope to cover even most of it here. But just very briefly, we have five different categories, uh, or rough categories. There can be direct effects. Uh, these are things that people experience either during their journeys of displacement or in their housing, in, in temporary housing in their countries of uh, destination. And this can be bodily injuries, uh, respiratory, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal conditions, rehydration, hypothermia, et cetera, et cetera. Now, infectious diseases are also quite important for displaced populations. Uh, diarrheal disease uh, and uh, diseases associated with uh, the highly uh, densely packed areas where these uh, displaced populations are usually housed. And also the lack of access to the desert and the drying water, which yeah, unfortunately can be probably water of poor quality. Uh, the, the transmission of diseases such as measles, meningitis, uh, and savage tuberculosis and vector vector one diseases. In addition to this, these populations are often facing because they move to different geographic regions, they find new pathogens, new infections which they have never faced before, and therefore they lack immunity against these infections. So this can actually make them more susceptible to get these kind of uh, infect, uh, 
infectious diseases. The poor housing conditions, as I mentioned, increase the, the, the transmission risk. And also, there has been documented that there is very low uh, vaccination rates sometimes amongst the displaced population, especially children, which place these children at an incremented risk for uh, for infectious disease. Non-communicable diseases are also a problem because uh, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and some chronic respiratory diseases are very prevalent in the overall population, especially in, in this region. And when these people mobilize, of course, they take the disease with them, but also during the mobilization, it might be very difficult for them to obtain access to the treatments and the medicines and the doctors that are needed to control or keep these diseases in check. And therefore, uh, it's a problem for the displaced population you know, when a large numbers of people with these kind of diseases accumulate, they can become a burden for the hosting countries. And you know, hosting countries need to do something to address the situation. Sexual and reproductive health are also an issue. Displaced individuals are particularly susceptible to be exploited and to be subject to sexual violence. And this causes an elevated risk of uh, infectious, uh, sexually transmitted disease and unwanted pregnancies. And also uh, for maternal, for prospecting mothers, there is an incremented risk for neonatal and perinatal morbidity and mortality uh, because it's very difficult for pregnant women that are being forcibly displaced to get the maternal care that they need. And at last, but probably most importantly, uh, we the major issue, issue for displaced populations. Uh, it's probably the most neglected issue uh, in this group. Uh, Experiences some level of trauma, and some people experience a very high level of trauma. It's been estimated that up to 50% of displaced people actually have mental health problems associated with the displacement. Children, of course, are highly susceptible, especially if they have witnessed uh, particular events of violence. Uh, and in the Amy region, there is a very uh, particular situation. Uh, of a scarcity of psychological support services, which makes it very difficult to address this important need. Um, and as some authors have proposed, uh, mental health issues can actually be transgenerationally transmitted. So people that have mental problems can actually raise children that are also um, troubled by mental problems. So this can be a very long lasting effect and is probably one of the biggest challenges for the health practitioners in the end to address this. Now we have identified uh, several gaps in knowledge and uh, the need for new research directions. Uh, of course, this is not a comprehensive list by far. So uh, we, I'm going to just briefly mention we have identified certain areas in certain needs in the field of vector-borne diseases. We need more biological data that to fit predictive models. We need a better monitoring and character characterization of the most relevant vector populations and pathogens in the region. We may need vector uh, the, the development of uh, an adaptation of novel and environmentally safe and efficient control tools for controlling the relevant disease vectors. And we need the development of efficient vaccines for the most important vector borne diseases. Um, also, uh, we have identified the need for the standardized monitoring of environmentally driven morbidity and mortality throughout the region, with particular emphasis on the exposure to heat and air pollution. Uh, we need to know more about the impacts of those exposure on chronic health conditions. We need to develop an internet health um, focused predictive models uh, and early warning systems that must consider the effect of susceptible groups, uh, particularly the existence of elder, large groups of elderly people. And we need to uh, develop and implement tools to improve, improve the uh, evaluation of mental health of the displaced populations. Um, there's also gaps in policy, and we want, as an outcome of this workshop, actually, to probably improve uh, our list of gaps in policy and proposed policies uh, to be inc included in the report that we're preparing. Uh, we would like to see uh, uh, initiatives that foster cross-border collaboration for the monitoring of infectious diseases, uh, with particular emphasis on vector-borne diseases. The training of health personnel in the detection and management of infectious diseases uh, that might potentially emerge in the region. And we also uh, want to foster the preparation of regional consistency pl uh, contingency plans to manage infectious diseases that might potentially emerge. Um, it's also necessary to develop and implement efficient health action plans through the EMA. And 
Very importantly, uh, policies need to be established for the provision of health service to displaced populations in the areas that I have already mentioned. So with this, um, thank you. I thank you for your attention and I will take any questions.